Welcome to the Rock of Roseville, home of the biggest mistletoe in the United States. Right there, just waiting for December. <laughs> no, a lot of hours went into that creative thing right there. What do you call that? What's it called? Is it called something? Beauty. A brand? Beauty. Beauty. <laughs> well, on that beautiful note, nothing says Mother's Day like a message on leprosy. So if you have a Bible, go to Luke chapter 17. <laughs> Crazy, I know. <laughs> One time at my church in Washington, this is no joke, on Mother's Day, I preached a message on Rahab the harlot. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. It's like, how do you do that? Who does that? It's like, it didn't even hit me, you know? It's like, I'm standing there, you know, these moms holding their flowers, and I thought, wow, Rahab the harlot. So I left Washington, came to California, <laughs> ran me out of town. Uh, we're uh, in a series called The Supernatural Life. You know, it, if we follow Jesus, uh, you can expect we would look increasingly like him. Would you agree with that? Would you agree that if we follow Jesus, we should experience some of the things that Jesus experienced, some of the things Jesus taught us that we would experience? Uh, there would be something different about us. Would you agree with that? Uh, I read a verse in 2 Timothy 3 when he talks about the characteristics of what the end times will look like, what the people will look like, what culture and society would look like. And then there's this phrase tucked in there that says, and people will have a form of godliness, but they'll deny the power thereof from such turn away. And I thought, man, I tell you, what I, when I came to Jesus, I did not sign up for a form of godliness. I did not sign up for a form of religion. I didn't sign up for uh, an exterior makeover because the depravity and the bankruptcy in my soul, you couldn't make over. You couldn't put a paint job on it. I needed an internal work by the Holy Spirit. I needed what the Bible calls a new birth from heaven. And that's what I experienced. And so, so for, for those of you out there that maybe don't know the Lord, I want to encourage you, don't settle for religion. Don't settle for rules, regulations. Don't, don't settle for lists, to-do lists. Settle for a biblical word of what life in the Spirit looks like. And it's a life full of joy. It's a life full of purpose. And you, know, and you may not feel like it all the time, but I'm telling you, when you tap into it, it ruins you for the other. And when we talk about, you know, a supernatural life, you know, it's, it's easy to get caught up on, you know, the big miracles. People love big miracles. And I, and, and I like big miracles. I like small miracles, too. And I watched Jesus, and he did little, little things. And he did big things. And, you know, for me, uh, 38 years of a, as being a Christ follower, I want to contend for the authentic uh, Jesus doesn't need props to be propped up. He doesn't need, you know, phony things. You know, he, he, he's real. The miracles are real. I'll share a few this morning uh, that have done nothing but etched in my heart that God is alive, active, powerful, and loves people deeply. Luke 17, yeah, we're going to talk about this situation with some lepers. And it's not really to highlight the disease, although I, I will talk about what this was really like so you can find yourself uh, really relating um, heart to heart. But Luke chapter 17, verse 11, now on his way to Jerusalem, you know, Jesus is heading, uh, this, these are his final days, and he's going to the cross. Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee, and as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance. You know, for a leper, being at a distance was the norm. You know, being on the outside looking in was the norm. Living a life that was uh, shoved to the margins, ostracized, labeled, stigmatized, that was the norm. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen anybody with leprosy, but the first mission trip I ever took many, many, many years ago to the Philippines uh, had an encounter with a man with leprosy. And leprosy, uh, you know, wears off the nubs of uh, fingers and, and, and toes and the nose and the ears. Uh, there's white blotches of skin. Uh, many times there's open sores that just, you know, continue to, to ooze and drain, uh, you know. And, and so it's, a, it's an intimidating sight. And, you know, being a young believer, I just, as I was going to, to meet these people, I was wondering what my response was going to be. And I remember praying, just saying, God, you know, just help me love well. Help me, help me just, you know, not be intimidated by what I see. Because I didn't know. I'd never seen anybody with leprosy. And, and so when I met the man that had leprosy, it was, it was amazing. The automatic response was to reach out and extend my hand to which he put his, 
you know, knuckles, which is all as he had left, into my hand, and I gave him a hug and pulled him in, and you could see the light in his eyes of what, you know, of being touched and loved by somebody, even if only for a moment. And, you know, and it was just one of those life-defining moments for me that I just tucked away, and that was on the first mission trip to the Philippines. And so when you just, you know, read the history of, of, of leprosy, these, these people, you know, they couldn't celebrate. They couldn't go to a loved one's funeral. They had to stay, you know, it was like 150 feet downwind. If the wind was blowing this way, they had to be at least 150 feet down, you know. So there was no, you know... You're living amongst lepers. You couldn't touch anybody else. You couldn't be touched. And so you just lived with the, the label and the stigmatism. What a horrible thing. You know, they had their clothes couldn't be intact. They had to wear torn clothes. You know, they had to cover their upper lip wherever they went in public and cry out unclean. I mean, cry out. This is who I am. Stay away from me. And when you just, you know, when you just think about that, uh, you know, in the Old Testament it says, And lepers were to live outside the camp. You know, so off, quarantined, by yourself. And, you know, these these are people, man. These are people. And we may not see leprosy today. Um, I I do have a doctor friend that once a year takes people up north in India to a a leprosy hospital and takes six to seven uh, medical interns to treat them and arrest the disease and to pray for them and to love on them. You know, I mean, that's that's a beautiful thing because that's what Jesus would do. Let me, let me just tell you, Jesus doesn't shy away or Jesus is not intimidated by disfigurement. Other people's or yours. Yeah. So, you know, you got this living alone and yelling unclean. And then to make matters worse, you had the rabbis and the teachers that would taught, they taught this tradition. They said, if you had leprosy, the finger of God is on your life because you have secret sin in your life. And so leprosy was the finger of God. Now, what's really interesting, and maybe this is why Jesus confronts tradition so hard, because he said the traditions of man make the word of God of no effect. Because people will believe traditions and, and, and it won't help them. And so they said it was the finger of God. And then I think it's interesting, if you go back a couple chapters and a few days, you see Jesus casting out demons and being accused of casting out demons by the spirit of the devil. And Jesus says this non-accidental phrase. He said, if I cast out demons by the finger of God. Everybody say, finger of God. If I cast out demons by the finger, finger of God, I tell you, the kingdom of God has come to you. Now, let me just tell you, when he says the finger of God, they're, they're thinking, we have always pronounced judgment by the finger of God, and now here's Jesus demonstrating deliverance by the finger of God. And then if you go, and then if you go throughout Scripture, you only see the finger of God referenced three different places, three different kinds of ways. One is in creative acts of God. Throughout the Psalms, it talks about the finger of God drawing out heaven and the boundaries, the finger of God being creative. The finger of God is, is, is something creative. And then the finger of God written on the Ten Commandments, written on the tablets of stone by the finger of God were commandments for life. And then the third, and they just happen to be all three C's, which is kind of cute um, for a preacher. Three and the third C uh, is casting out demons. So tradition messed with God's heart. They countered it, and Jesus came back and said, and I raise you a deliverance of a demon by the finger of God. I, you know what? I just, I think that's just, I love how Jesus confronts things. You know, which just, which a sentence, man, spooled them out. Now, when I talk about leprosy, and there, I, I go back to the first miracle I ever saw in a church. And uh, you're talking 38 years ago. I didn't know another Christian, okay? When I got saved, it's not like I had, you know, some friends that were Christians, knew Jesus, went to church that I could call up and say, hey, can I go to church with you? I knew zero, none, nine, nada. Didn't know anybody. So I went out on a journey, man. I bought a Bible, and I just started going to churches. And I went to every kind of church imaginable. I went to Episcopalian churches. I went to Catholic churches. So intimidated, didn't know what to do. So I kind of watched what other people were doing, and I just did what they did. 
And so, you know, they would like do this little genuflex before they went. And so I'd do this little thing like that. I mean, I didn't know what it was. You know, I'd see them make the sign of the cross. I made the sign of the cross. You know, whatever they did, you know, the part where they turn around, peace be with you. Yeah. And, and also with you, you know. And so I would just imitate because I didn't know what you were supposed to do in church. Went to Nazarene, Assemblies of God, Pentecostal, Baptist. I'd go one week to a church that was just out of control happy, and then I'd go to a, a church the next week, and everybody's in a suit and tie, and they look mad. <laughs> it was like, no, I mean, so for me, church was kind of a bizarre place. You know, I come out of the bars, and you know, you know what you're getting in the bars. Everybody's fake happy. I mean, right? You know what you're getting straight across the board. But to come into the religious arenas of church and just see just all kinds of paradoxes and dichotomies and, you know, different, one, one week it'd be this, one week it'd be that. And so I didn't know. So I just kept going. Well, I landed in a Mennonite church because I know I look really Mennonite. And I don't even know how I got there. I'll be honest with you. I have no idea how I got there. But all of a sudden, I'm in a Mennonite church with about 70 people. And it was really weird because there was two pastors, and I didn't know how many pastors there were supposed to be, but there was two. But I, I noticed that out of these 70, 80 people, that it was kind of split. There was one pastor who was charismatic, which I guess was a new thing for the Mennonites, so very expressive. And, you know, when he led worship, it was trying to get everybody to raise their hands, and he was working them and working them. And I just remember thinking, that's just really, you know, kind of an odd thing, you know, that he's working so hard to get people with my hands lifted up. Come on, everybody. And at 10 minutes, you know, and there'd be some reluctant, you know. <laughs> you know, and then the other ones didn't want to be disloyal to the conservative pastor. So they kept their hands in their pockets. But here's what happened. They would have a time of prayer. And once again, I don't know anything about how you do things in church. And so they said, does anybody have any prayer needs? And so a guy stands up and says, you know, I have been battling with alcohol and an addiction for a long time. He was an older guy for a long time, and, and I would like prayer. And I'm just thinking, dude, you just aired your dirty laundry out in front of all these Mennonites. You know, can you do that? And people went around him. And they prayed for him. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Then another guy stands up, and he was, and, and I can see him crystal clear today. And I know his name, I remember his face, and he stood up and he, he said, and he was wearing a short sleeve shirt, and he says, you know, I have this skin condition, um, and I don't know, it was like eczema, psoriasis, combination, but he had, you know, white cracks everywhere, hands, ears, nose, around his mouth. I mean, it, it was an obvious thing, and he goes, you know, can't get, you know, just can't get rid of it, and I hate it, and, you know, he, he just went on. I just thought, God, how humiliating, man, you stand up in front of... You know, because I was the shallowest guy on the planet, man. So to hear somebody out, like talk about something deep, personal, and meaningful was just, whoa, galaxies away. So I'm feeling sorry for the guy. I'm thinking, oh, dude, this is oh, so embarrassing. I just cringe. I remember cringing. But he was serious. And he just said, I, I really believe that if the elders of the church anoint me with oil and pray for me, I know I'll be healed. And I remember thinking, gosh, you said that? You can say that? <laughs> Once again, I don't know nothing, man. I mean, Pages of my Bible are just still stuck together. I know nothing. And I'm just thinking, you can say that? And they, they said, Let's, we'll, we'll agree with you, Eric. And they all got around him, and they laid hands on him, and they prayed for him. And I just thought, wow, man, that might be a bummer if that doesn't work out. You know, I mean, I'm thinking, this, I just, that's how I think. I hadn't learned how to polish up yet. So I was just, you know, I just thought, man, that's just, ooh. It's like two weeks later, man, that guy comes up, and it's prayer time again. He goes, I just want to stand up and give glory to God. I want you to just look. Well, you guys prayed and everything. And I'm telling you what, completely healed. And I remember thinking, jeez, man. God, you do that kind of stuff? It was amazing. I was amazed at the humility it took to say that in front of all those people. And I was amazed at the sincerity of how they prayed and ministered grace to that guy. And then I was absolutely blown away the fact you know, I mean, we're not talking about a headache. We're not talking about, I had a headache, praise God, it's gone. You know, I'm talking about, I saw the white blotches all over his body. You could feel the torment inside. You could feel all that kind of stuff. And then two weeks later, it's like, wow, man, that's the kind of God I'm, I'm looking for. That's the kind of God I, I want to encounter. That's the kind of God I'm reading about in scriptures. And so, you know, verse 13, Luke chapter 7, he called out. They called out in a loud voice. You know, it's great. In the Greek, <clears throat> the Greek words for loud voices where we get the word megaphone. 
Isn't that kind of funny, man? I mean, these guys cried out, yelled out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And it was so loud that the words we use for megaphone is what those words were, were right there. And you know what they're crying out for right there? When they're crying out for mercy, they're crying out for deliverance from the judgment that they think they're under. That's what they're crying out for. Have mercy on us. Take this sentence that's been imposed on us. Take it away. Remove the stigma, the shame, the alienation, the isolation. Remove all it. They actually believe that Jesus can do something. That's, that's powerful. And I read that and I thought, you know what? That's six prayers. That's a six-word prayer. Six words. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Do you know how many books are written on prayer? You can go to Amazon, and there's 50,000 that will show up right now. But you know, nobody just talks about a six-word prayer. Now, I love, I love people that are intercessors. I love them. They come up, you know, I prayed for three hours yesterday. <laughs> it's like, you're, you're, you're good. I'm a six-word prayer. I really am. I, I read that, and I was thinking about that, and I do pray longer, but I thought about my prayer life over 38 years, and I can tell you that the number one prayer that I have prayed always is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. About 8,942 times. <clears throat> Why? Because I believe I'm a man who needs mercy. I, I, I believe I'm a man that didn't just need mercy when I didn't know God and when I was an alcoholic, I believe I, I need the mercy of God right now. I need the grace of God right now. Because I know me, and I may have stopped drinking, and God has delivered me from that, but I know there's all kinds of pollution that goes on here and here at times, and here. <laughs> it goes. And so you know what? I need mercy. Do you need mercy? I need mercy. Mercy. Four words that connect this story. Mercy is the active desire to remove distress. Compassion that's gone active. In the four gospel, there isn't a record of anybody that cried out for mercy from Jesus that he didn't grant them mercy. They cried out in faith. They cried out in hope. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says this. I love this verse. And this, this, is, this is one to, to marinate on. This is one to just man, meditate on this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. What kind of mercy? What kind of mercy? Why, why is it great mercy? Why is it mercy standing alone would be good enough, wouldn't it? Mercy, yeah. No, great mercy, excessive mercy, abundant mercy, superfluous mercy, mercy on steroids. <laughs> why? Because we still deal with sin and the brokenness in the human condition. But this is who Jesus is, and he's given us new birth into a living hope. Ugh. We're not talking Hallmark card hope. We're, we're talking living hope. Why? Because Jesus is called the blessed hope, and he lives. And in him we live and move and have our being. New birth into a living hope through what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in the believer. That's why we can have hope. I mean, that, that, of course, we get assaulted. We get discouraged. That's part of us as humans, man. But I'm telling you, we have access to the living hope anytime we choose. God have mercy. Now, think about this for a moment. Once again, defining moments. I become a Christian, and I, and I, I, I walk with this convic conviction that, that is happening to me. I keep thinking about a girl in junior high and elementary school that I tormented. And she had, uh, she had eczema. She had psoriasis really bad to the point where her hands cracked and bled. And I was merciless. You know, I was just a young guy, just an idiot, just a fool, just mean, just cantankerous. And, you know, man, I, I would just say some of the just worst things to her. And, you know, I, I didn't even think about it until I got saved and became a Christian and started following Jesus. And then I started getting this, man, she'd just pop into my head. And I would just feel, oh, really? And I'd just say, God, forgive me. Please forgive me. And then there was a desire to repent to her. 
I didn't know where I didn't know where she was. You know, I mean, we're talking years later. My I lived in another city, but it just wouldn't go away. And then somehow it was on. You know, this is the internet's coming out, and then there was something, and it had to do with our high school or something. And I saw her name, and there was an access you could email people, and there she was. And and so I emailed her, and I poured my guts out to her, and I owned every ounce of meanness jerkiness, owned it, begged her. I said, I beg you to forgive me, even though I, and I don't deserve it. And if you don't, I would totally understand. But I owned every ounce of it. I get an email like a day later, two days later. Of course I forgive you, and I release you. And that went on a lot in my life. But like the saying goes, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And for me, it made me stronger. And I have a great life and a husband and kids. And she went on and on and on. And it was like the relief of that just washed over. Now, fast forward the tape. Great mercy. God's great mercy. So you go from the guy I saw in the Mennonite church when I first got saved, the first miracle, the conviction of this girl and the torment that I experienced for the torment that I dished out, the forgiveness and the release. And now you fast forward the tape about eight years 10 years. I'm speaking at a Wednesday night service in our church, and I tell that story. I just tell that story. I think it was along the lines of forgiveness or whatever, but I tell that story. And after the service, you know, people come forward for prayer, whatever, and I see this lady walking up, and she's got white gloves on her hands. And, you know, in my mind, I'm just thinking, well, that's kind of weird, you know. It's summer and white gloves, and just seemed a little whatever, off. You know, that, that's just... Carnal Bob, you know, just thinking <laughs> thoughts. And so she comes up, and, and, and I, had, I had said the name of the girl that I had, you know, been really mean and hostile to. And when she came up, she pulled her gloves off and said, I'm like the girl. And when she pulled her gloves off, her hands were cracked, bloody. Um, you know, just, it was just really sad. She goes, I've dealt with this for I don't know how many years, and I've tried every medication, every steroid, every cream, every lotion, every prescription, and they've almost amputated my hands a couple of times. And you know what? Right there, when I saw that, it was like the Holy Spirit just said, I'm going to give you a redemptive moment by my grace. And I knew, I I can just tell you, I knew right then when I saw her hands that God was going to heal her. I knew that. I can't tell you. I can, I, and I knew it was a dot connect of the faith that I had from seeing that guy get healed here, the redemptive conversation with the girl here, and the divine do-over by God, because that's what he does. He gives us do-overs, mulligans for you golfers. <laughs> he does. And so anointed her with prayer, grabbed her hands, prayed for her, and it was a week to two weeks. She came back, and her hands were, I mean, I'm telling you what, completely healed. It was mind-blowing. I'm, t- I'm just telling you, that's a mind-blowing experience for me. Once he- you know what that was? That was the great mercy of God for her in her condition, and then that was the great mercy of God for me. Mm. I love that, man. Verse 14, Luke 17. When he saw them, it's Jesus, when he saw them, he saw them, you know, it's not a casual glance. It's, it says he saw them. He, he discerned what was going on. He saw, he saw their spiritual condition. He saw their history. He saw their physical condition. He saw their emotions. He saw the shame. He saw the whole nine yards in their life. He saw them. And he said, go show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. When did they get cleansed? As they went. What was that? That was a step of faith. There's no record of a priest in Scripture that cleanses a leper. There's a prophet that cleanses a leper, just with his words in a river. But that was all outlined in Luke, I mean, in Leviticus 13 and 14, how you're supposed to treat lepers and the ceremonial law and, 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 and all the, this is what you do. And, 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 and a priest never healed a leper. As all as they could do was acknowledge that they were clean, that they had been healed of the conditions. And basically what they would do is the, uh, the guy would come, you know, and, uh, 
you know, they would probably, they would know, they knew who the lepers were, and so they would come, and the priest would examine him and just see, you know, yeah, is he clean indeed? Is he, you know, yeah, okay, you look good, and then here's what he would do. He would, he would ask for two doves to come, uh, bring two doves here, and then get uh, an earthen vessel and fill it with living water. Earthen vessel, living water. The typology is amazing here. Fill it with water. This is where it gets really Mother's Day. <laughs> Take one dove, cut the throat, drain the blood into the vessel. Sorry, sorry. You get succulents on the way out. <laughs> so, okay, so. <laughs> what you have to do to get that succulent? I had to listen to a bloody sermon. <laughs> so, you take, so. Cut the, cut, the, cut the throat, drain the blood into the vessel. Take a cedar stick, hyssop, take a scarlet thread, wrap it around the stick, the hyssop. Dip the hyssop and the branch into the, the bloody water. Touch the guy seven times. Seven times with bloody water. Then take the living dove, dunk it in the bloody water, and set it free. Wow, what a great picture, huh? I mean, you think of Holy Spirit, man. You think about the blood of Jesus. You think about our sins and sickness being carried away in the resurrection. I mean, man, that is like good stuff, bloody, yeah. But, I mean, it's big stuff. And then after that, there was a whole other process I don't have time to go into. But he said, go show your priest. Go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. I mean, that's obedience. Verse 15, it isn't it interesting that they prayed six words? Talked about that, six-word prayer. I don't know why, but Jesus gives them a six-word response. Don't even know what that's about. Kind of fun, though. Verse 15, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. And he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. You know, Samaritans and Jews weren't even supposed to hang out. But when you're, when you're that miserable, you find whoever you can hang out with. And so... Jesus marvels. Isn't it interesting? Just seems that gratitude and ingratitude get God's attention. In fact, one of the mar- marks of the last days is that people will be unholy and unthankful. Now, don't, don't confuse gratitude with the social science of gratitude because gratitude's a big, big thing right now. You, you know, you watch Oprah, you watch, you know, new age people, success motivators out there. And they'll tell you, you got to have gratitude and make a list. And this is the way you can get goodness into your life. Let me just say, that's all true. And I, and I don't have time, but there are studies out there that talk about the effects of gratitude physically, socially, psychologically, in every way. Health, the whole nine yards. But let me just say this. As the body of Christ, we don't practice gratitude so we can enhance our life. We practice gratitude because we know that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. That's, it's, okay, I got a list of eight things right now. My life's going to be really good. No, God's really good. We got to pay attention to his goodness in our life. And And there are benefits around the deal. There's, a, there's benefits for all of it. Now, the head-scratching thing for me was there was one time where um, my assistant pastor's wife was an oncology, oncology nurse at Stevens Hospital up where we were at, not far from the church. She called and said, I got this young guy with this neuroblastoma something or other, brain cancer, and it's bad, and his parents dropped him off and left him, and they haven't come back to see him in weeks. And he's in bad shape, and he's loaded on chemo cocktail, out, you know, just in excess. And she said, can you just send, you know, a couple guys up there just to talk to the guy? And I said, sure. I sent a couple guys up there. They went up, built a, l- a relationship with him, brought a pizza up to him, watched some videos, DVDs, movies, and no, VHSs. I stand corrected. <laughs> VHSs. And then they, uh, and then... The guy came to church on a Wednesday night. Now, I saw the guy. I mean, he, he, he had one foot in the grave. You, you needed zero dis- discernment. I mean, bad shape, bad shape. Looked bad. 
I didn't know this, but somebody that I knew that he was coming down the hall before the service asked him, what would it take to, for you to give your life to Jesus? And he said, I'd have to get healed. I didn't know this. I didn't know this conversation took place. And so we're in worship, and I'm standing like right there, and he's standing right behind me over two chairs. God, the compassion of God was just there. And, and I turned around, and I said, hey, you know, I know you're in bad shape, but would you mind if we prayed for you? And I don't want to embarrass you, but, man, these, these people know how to pray, and we love to pray. And is that all right? He goes, yeah. Fine. He's like 28, 29, and he was yellow. You know, you could tell his kidneys were going, everything. was just bad. He looked bad. So he came forward. I told the church, this is who he is. This is what's going on. Can we pray? People just surrounded that guy and prayed for him. That was on a Wednesday night. <clears throat> I think it was a week from the next day, the Thursday, a week later, she called me, the nurse, my assistant pastor's wife, and said, he just got out of his CAT scans and all that, man, and he is completely, completely free of cancer. Completely. <laughs> completely. Mind-blowing. I mean, that's mind-blowing. I mean, this is a nurse that I know. This isn't some, you know, I heard through somebody that heard through somebody that lives five countries over that, you know, you know. No, this is like, I know the players. Saw them, saw the player. I know death. I know what death looks like. Been around it. I know what it looks like. I can see it. I know what the doctor said. I know what the nurse said. I know what the CAT scan said. Now, I don't know about you, but how many of you, if that happened to you, would be really grateful? Would you like, I mean, would there be something in your heart that just kind of went, Pitter patter. Thank you, somebody. Would, I mean, wouldn't you have that? Never saw the guy again. Never saw the guy again. And you know what? I scratched my head. The same way that Jesus was scratching his head here. Where's the other nine? Are you the only one, a Samaritan, a foreigner, that came back and gave thanks to God, gave glory to God? And as soon as I want to pounce, pounce on those people, I, I ask myself, what's my ratio of gratitude? Could it be that I'm a one out of tenner? I started thinking, what, you know, what, am I thankful? Do I give thanks to God? Do I take the time to sit down, and not just for the obvious, but for the inobvious, even to the point where my last breath was a gift, my current breath is a gift right now, and any breath I get to take after this is a gift from God. At least that's what Acts chapter 17 says, that he gives all men breath and life. Who gives breath and life? God. You're sucking air right now because God said, it's okay. <laughs> Anyways, just thought about when I got the wind knocked out of me in football one time. <laughs> Couldn't breathe. No gift there. Anyways, <laughs> Anthony and Anu are here, and Anu told me a story that was kind of like the leprosy that we just read about, and I just want her to come and just share this short story, because it's really good, so would you welcome Anu Sonoa as she comes. Hello, family. I'm happy to be home. Um, I don't know if this is home or that is home. Since I'm here, I will call this home. <laughs> so one day, Anthony and I, we were going about in town. It's a very hot, humid day. And uh, we decide we should go to a very uh, cool place uh, where they have AC. And there is this high-end restaurant in our town. And it is called McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> so just to get some... AC and cool drink, we go to McDonald's, and as we are walking inside McDonald's, I see this lady sitting at the entrance of McDonald's panhandling, and I immediately look, my eye fall on her neck. She is wearing a necklace, uh, which is a red and white beaded necklace, and it is worn by Devdasi community ladies, and if you guys remember, the primary group we have gone to India to minister is Dave Das Eagles, and uh, they are temple prostitutes. And uh, there's a tug in my heart as soon as I see, like, what is she doing here on this part of the town? And we go inside, grab a meal, and uh, we go sit by the window, and she 
walks there and she hand motions like give me something so again it's like I can't sit quiet my heart is beating I have to do something I go grab some fries grab a drink go outside and I give her the drink she just takes the drink she doesn't take the fries because she doesn't know what fries are it's western food so and I walk back inside and I start eating my meal and again Holy Spirit doesn't let me have that peace in my heart it's just so uncomfortable I say to Anthony I just can't sit and eat here I have to do something so I go outside uh, walk outside and uh, I sit on the bench and she's sitting on the floor and she's ha just happy that I come out and say hello to her and I start talking to her I ask her just a few questions like what are you doing here why are you here and uh, she's readily opens her heart and start sharing the whole nine yards long story short uh, she goes to explain how she got trapped into the Devdasi system and uh, uh, she, t she goes on to tell me that uh, she, uh, an ox ran into her side and it had cut. And she lifts up her sari and shows me like where she had the cut, the wound. And uh, this is going on for about 20, 30 minutes, sharing all her life story. And then I notice something while she's sharing. Her ear, ear is hurt, like this, this wound on her ears. And I ask her, what happened to your ears? And she said, oh, because the ox had ran into my side, I had to go to the hospital. And there's this one man who told me he will take me to the hospital. So I trusted him and I went with him. What he did was uh, he took her to the side of the street and pushed her on the side and plucked her ears, uh, stole the ears, earrings, basically. And uh, somebody else came and helped her uh, to get back. And... Uh, I just tell her, do you want to hear something interesting I have to say? I know you worship this goddess. The goddess they are dedicated to is called Yalama. And uh, I know you worship Yalama, but do you want to hear about this god, this man who loves you, who cares about you, and he knows everything about your life? And I just tell a little bit that uh, about his good nature. And she stops and she asks me, can you give me his address? I want to go and meet him. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, oh God, she didn't get it. I said, okay, I will uh, tell you who he is, but you have to listen to what I'm telling you. She patiently listens uh, to who Jesus is, what he's able to do, uh, how he died on the cross, and uh, how she can receive salvation and be set free from the trap she is in. And uh, she receives Jesus. She gives her life to Jesus after listening to who Jesus is. And uh, at three different points, she says, your words are like golden. Like what you're saying is golden. And uh, she said to me that I'm satisfied today. And uh, as she, I just uh, help her. There's a picture of her. And uh, probably, yeah. So I'm sitting on the other side of Ronald McDonald. <laughs> you can't see me, but you can see the joy and that happiness on her face when she hears about Jesus. And I help her uh, to get up and, you know, just Indian culture, she, do, she does all these gestures, touching my feet, thanking me, doing namaskar, and I just help her to get up and walk. And she says to me, nobody has ever been so kind to me and talked like a normal human being. And then as we are walking, I just tell her, uh, you're an older woman, you should not be begging on the streets, it's not good. And she tells me, oh no, I just beg on Saturdays. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the story that happened, uh, that God had appointed at that time at McDonald's.